not find O.J. Simpson guilty of double murder. As one author uh, boldly stated, blacks and whites live in two different worlds. The O.J. jury had seen a great deal of police brutality and misconduct in their community. They knew the police planted evidence. Therefore, they were rightly skeptical of police evidence. They, the jury perceived some cops, many cops, don't like Black people enough to cause a reasonable doubt about the evidence. In psychology, the principle of cognitive dissonance states that when people absorb, absorb new information conflicted with what they already know, they integrate it into pre-existing attitudes and beliefs. Some say the principles helps explain the decision of the O.J. Simpson jury. But consider these divergent views of what's supposed to be a common reality. Some claim that the insurrection on January 6, 2021, was the result of a racist demagogue. Others claim that it was a lawful patriotic protest. Some say racism remains a pervasive problem for many non-white Americans. Others have the audacity to say white Americans are the primary victims of discrimination. Some say America is a nation of immigrants who bolster the economy and reinvigorate the country. Others say non-white immigrants bring crime and are poisoning the blood of our nation. If there's a phrase that captures this dual inversion of America, it may be alternative facts. Remember that phrase? It entered the American lexicon in 2017 during an exchange between Kellyanne Conway, who was a senior advisor to Trump, and an NBC journalist. When the interviewer pressed Kelly Conway on a false White House claim about Trump's inauguration drawing the largest crowd ever, she responded that Press Secretary Sean Spicer had given alternative facts. But 20 years before Conway, Simpson's trial had already revealed the potency behind such reasoning. No matter how much overwhelming evidence you have, there are always alternative facts. The prosecution in the Simpson murder trial thought their case was a slam dunk, with strong forensic evidence tying Simpson to the killings. Well, it didn't matter. There were alternative facts. Before there was fake news, there was fake DNA. What started in that Los Angeles courtroom has now spread throughout America's political, and pop culture, seeing isn't believing anymore. Is that video real or is it a deep fake? Did that student write that term paper or did AI generate it? Is that a person friending you on social media or is it a bot? OJ Simpson gave us a preview of an America in which it's becoming harder for anyone to believe their eyes or ears. It's no wonder that so many people follow the news of that solar eclipse. It was a rare experience where millions of Americans witnessed the same event and few, though not all, talked about alternative facts. Black Americans have long viewed the justice system as rigged, but now millions of white Americans claim to share the same view, thanks in part to Donald Trump. The former president is facing, of course, four criminal cases, one underway already in New York City, an 88 felony charges. He has pleaded not guilty to every single charge and claims to be a victim of corrupt prosecution. And he still has millions of white supporters standing behind him. About 85 percent of Republican voters in 2022 midterms were white, though there are signs that he may be attracting more black and Latino voters. This morning, though, we are going to dive into these issues confronting the uncomfortable white noise and the realities of African Americans and the American justice system. We got an all-star panel. Lauren Burke is with us. Rashonda Tate is with us as well. Katia Woods. And of course, Tacoma is with us from the Chicago Defender. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All um Tacoma, look, I'm gonna start with you and then we're gonna give way to the ladies. Um <laughs> now again, we're not going to relitigate whether somebody believes he's guilty, or somebody believes he was innocent. It doesn't matter in 2024. But what matters is, as we talked about, the lead up, the atmosphere, how that trial changed America. We saw in, in the lead up to the program, as Greer um, showed the archives, you had, a, you had a white woman claiming racism. 
I mean, the atmosphere was such that um, the trial. Talk, well, I'm gonna let you talk about the atmosphere. I think you were right to um, in your um, eloquent roundup, uh, providing the context of what was going on at the time in the early to mid '90s, particularly in Los Angeles. Um, in that timeline, it's appropriate to include the beating of Rodney King in 1991, which I believe is a closely, as you stated, as you inferred, is a closely related phenomenon to what we experienced in 1995 with the O.J. Simpson verdict. And again, pointing out that when those cheers erupted among Black people, they were certainly not really about O.J., who really wasn't down with us. It was about finally experiencing and being on the right side of a verdict that has long been discriminatory against us. Um, and uh, I think what Rodney King proved is that you can have an atrocity happen before your eyes, but the justice that comes with it is often not um, appropriate. Um, it's not just. And in here, OJ represents an inversion of that. Yeah, and, and Lauren, you wrote um, for uh, Black Crush USA, um, under the headline, football legend O.J. Simpson dies, but the obsession remains alive. And um, one of the things that that uh, you mentioned was a pivotal point in the, in the Simpson trial came with the realization that one of the detectives in the case had made racist statements in the past. Um, that, obviously, we know was one of the biggest turning points. Um, Bring us back to that time when Mark Furman was exposed for what he was. Uh, well, you know, Mark Furman, uh, who was a police detective for the Los Angeles Police Department, of course, was forced to plead the Fifth Amendment upon asking, uh, upon being asked whether or not he planted evidence. That kind of was the <laughs> the deal breaker right there. If you're pleading, if you're pleading on such a, on that type of a question. And basically what happened in the case was that uh, really, I think for the first time in America, you have a black defendant on trial who has the resources to defend themselves in a way that uh, white folks have had for years. So he had really the best legal team that anyone has had, I think, ever. I can't think of a case where you had more attorneys that were acclaimed at the time. Barry Sheck was just starting out as a forensic expert, a, a well-known DNA was new. Yeah. He was right when DNA was new. And of course, he goes on to found the Innocence Project. He was young then and he was a part of that team. And of course, you had F. Lee Bailey, who was at the time, a, at that time, a prominent trial attorney. Uh, and of course, you had Johnny Cochran. There's not to mention the others, Robert Kardashian and, and the others. I mean, he had a five person team that frankly just outmatched Chris, Dar uh, Chris Darden and and the team that was, of course, uh, the, acting for the state. So right there, you had something unprecedented, a black person who's a defendant in a murder case, a double homicide case, that has the resources to defend themselves. That's unprecedented right in itself. Then you have the fact that we in America, uh, and I think white folks just don't appreciate this because we just don't teach it in school. And to the extent we do teach it, they don't gen generally care. Uh, we have a history in this country, certainly of extrajudicial justice pointed directly at the cohort that O.J. Simpson is a part of, which is black men. That extrajudicial justice has involved murdering black men at the rumor of crime. Forget about having a case or anything else, at the rumor of crime. That had been going on for centuries. Uh, nobody has any appreciation for that. And of course, on top of that, you had what you'd already mentioned, which was uh, the Rodney King case happening in the same vicinity of that time. We, we, we know contemporaneously that, you know, people get away with murder all the time. I, I happen to think that OJ did do it. I think he did murder Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. Mm -hmm. I, he had, they had me at the, the Bruno Mogley shoes at the scene, basically. It was very hard which, to find Which that. happened to have been a find by the National Enquirer of all people found exactly. the photo exactly. of him wearing those shoes after denying that he never owned a pair of those ugly... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you, you knew that something had happened. He'd had a history of violence with Ms. Uh, Brown. Uh, and so that was all out there. But at the same time, you know, we as African-Americans are used to injustice and white folks are just not. OK, we're used to hearing that George Zimmerman gets away with murder for killing a teenager with some Skittles and, and, and some iced tea one night. 
because he just has to approach him and pretend that he's a cop, which he is not. We're used to uh, we're used to Byron De La Beckwith. We're used to all of these things where people, white folks, have gotten away with murder over and over again, decade after decade, and really century after century. White folks are not used to that. So when OJ got away with murder, they all flipped out. I happened to be at ABC News in the first year of ABC News. People crying in their offices, hysterical, all of this. And I'm sitting there going, we as Black people have heard this a million times. Y'all need to relax. OK, just because it happened once for us and it's I mean, once for you and it's happened thousands of times for us. I mean, that to me was sort of hysterical. Well, I'll stop there and, and listen yeah, to everybody I wanna, else. <laughs> yeah, I want to go. Um, Rashonda, um, and one of the things, one of the s- several things Lauren mentioned there was the whole uh, domestic violence thing. That's the other thing that that um, changed seem to have changed with the O.J. Simpson case, the, the recognition of domestic violence. That's really where Mark Furman comes in as well, not with just the planting of the, uh, or the alleged planting of the glove, but even with the domestic violence, Mark Furman had a history with O.J. and Nicole and, and domestic violence calls. But before O.J., we didn't seem to, when I say we, we're talking about greater public and, and the media itself as well, didn't seem to pay a whole lot of attention to domestic violence. Well, again, you're, you know, they're paying attention now because it's a beautiful white woman who was abused, you know, and it's just like when it comes to the missing girls, um, attention was paid because this beautiful white woman's life was taken. And that's not to belittle anything, you know, and take away from the, the tragic murder. But I think, again, um, like Lauren said, we had gotten to the point where we were immune to this type of stuff, but now a national light is being um, shown on it. I think OJ's death just reminds us of the realities of race in America. We really didn't. I don't think that anybody was like, I'm down for OJ, whatever. You know, it was about the balancing the scales of an injustice system. And I think the domestic violence issue kind of got lost in all of that, um, trying to um, empathize with the reasons why so many Black people felt this way. It was substantial three decades ago, and it still is. You know, for many Black people, the acquittal was a matter of justice according to a different principle weighed on a different scale. And I think the domestic violence issue just kind of got brushed under the rug. So interesting, Katia, um, with um, the case there and with how America... OJ was one who never and black people say this all the time and and it's true i mean i don't know a different way of saying it but he never claimed his blackness Mm -hmm. until he had to um he never uh you know he was put in a position where we we knew and if you look at his the documentaries uh, even not even looking at the documentary look at his 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 history his life It, it was a guy who refused like other athletes his peers i'm talking about jesse owens and muhammad ali and others who stood for the cause, who was outspoken for the cause during the height of their careers, OJ declined. That wasn't his fight, he said. That wasn't his thing. Really, the black movement wasn't his movement. Um, but it, it's it's really interesting how during that trial, Katia, if you recall, when they took the jurors to OJ's home, how Johnny Cochran orchestrated the, uh, as as Greer and I was talking about the code switching, they orchestrated the putting up black photos, photos that black folks would have. He, they changed out all of the uh, the white photos. Talk about that a little bit when you have celebrities like O.J. Simpson, who never claimed his blackness, but when that time came, that blackness worked for him. That's the famous quote he had. You know, I'm not black. I'm O.J. You know, I mean, it's just. Yeah, I mean, he 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 lost a little bit a sense of reality. He thought money could erase or his blackness would have people see him for him. And then you know this awful awful event occurs, and he found out just how black he was. You know what I mean? Because you know, ever all his quote unquote white friends were like, "We good." You know what I mean? They did the people in the neighborhood that he lived. They didn't want him living there. They didn't want to be associated with him anymore. All the invites ceased. So he found out real quick how black he was. And, you know, I mean, 
that was his get out of jail card, you know, for him to to claim his blackness. And it was due to black people that he was, you know, had an a bit he had a fighting chance. Cause if he didn't have black people, he he would no doubt would have went to jail and he would have died in jail, that pretty much. So yeah, a- absolutely. And and the other thing, too, uh, um, we saw and I think it was touched on a little bit, but let's go more into this Takuma Lauren. Um, um, the prosecution spent something like eight to nine million dollars prosecuting him. I believe it was eight hundred thousand a month is what the uh, price tag was. But O.J. Simpson, <laughs> excuse me, um, his bill came up to six and a half million. And, and why is that significant? Well, one of the problems that African Americans have historically faced with the justice system, as you know, Takuma, um, is we can't afford to fight it. The resources for a prosecution uh, for a prosecution is almost endless. Uh, O.J. was able to do that. Talk? Could you talk a little bit about uh, his position, uh, financial position, to be able to do that? And how big was that? Oh, he's on mute. I'm on mute. Oh, oh, there you go. Sorry. There you go. I think one of the things that isn't talked about enough is again, um, and I think people have lost this sense now that we're decades removed from that era of OJ and the trial, is what he was at the time. Um, if you could put it in context of today, it would be as if um, a famous athlete. It would, it would be as if Shaq were on trial. Um, you know, back then, because that's how big O.J. Simpson was. You talk about a former athlete who was very successful with his run with the Buffalo Bills, one of the best, enjoying one of the best seasons ever, a uh, 2,000-yard rusher, to someone who's been able to ingratiate himself into Hollywood society um, and have this amazing career, first as a pitchman running through the airport uh, for a car rental commercial mm-hmm. to starring in these movies, um, that were really popular, especially the comedies that I'm thinking of, the Naked Gun series. So you had somebody with uh, an extraordinary life who was far removed from the realities of what uh, Black people had faced in South Central when he was in Brentwood, California. Um, And so I think that's part of it, Um, the, the ability to have those resources to be able to assemble um, as it was mentioned earlier, this all-star legal team, when for us, um, unfortunately, when it comes to the criminal justice justice system, a lot of people's realities are closer to what occurred with Khalif Browder as opposed to O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Oh, without question. Um, and, and, and Lauren, uh, you know, you mentioned um, the, the Mark Furman situation. That's that. But there's another example of having the resources, right? To be able to go out and get a private investigator to to be able to uncover these things, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, remember that Alan Dershowitz was like a backbencher on that team. <laughs> I mean, when you have Alan Dershowitz as somebody who's a secondary attorney sitting there uh, and Robert Shapiro and Johnny Cochran, of course, was really acting as the lead uh, in that situation. But I, I just would say, again, I can't think of another case offhand whether it was a celebrity or not, where you had a stronger legal team. And of course, mm-hmm. the way our country works is you have a right to counsel, but it's the counsel that you can afford. And a lot of these jurisdictions around the country, uh, you know, legal defense that is provided for free is not very good. And, and, and for cases that are capital, you know, crimes and felony crimes. So that defendant is at a huge disadvantage against the state. And quite frankly, what happened in this situation was that Marsha Clark, And Chris Darden could not keep up with F. Lee Bailey and Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro and Robert Kardashian and Alan Dershowitz. They just could not keep up with these guys. They just could not. It was a simple fact. You could see it in court. They made huge mistakes. To this Mm -hmm. day, Alan Dershowitz, who had a book out on this entire thing, of course, brings up some of the huge mistakes they made. The glove mistake was massive because apparently they could have had O.J. behind the scenes trying the glove on or not trying the glove on to see whether the glove fit before we got out on stage during open trial. They made the big mistake of having all that happen in open trial. Johnny Cochran, of course, knew what he was doing. 
And Johnny Cochran had more years of experience as a trial attorney, I think, than anybody in terms of years in, in court. And, um, you know, it showed. And so OJ was able to get away with a double homicide, which is a serious thing to get away with for anybody, black or white, a double homicide in a jurisdiction that is moneyed. You know, this is Los Angeles. It's not like some small, you know, town in the South. And it happened. And, and frankly, the, the system worked as it would have worked for a white defendant, which is why I think everyone got crazy, because that wasn't supposed to be how it's supposed to work. How it's supposed to work is we are supposed to declare, we the majority are supposed to declare that you're guilty. We see this all the time, by the way, um, with certain social movements that are going on as well. I, I think about Me Too when I sit and say this. I mean, there, we're at a point with Me Too where it's almost like, I get to declare you're guilty without trial, without evidence, without even really a conversation. And the media sort of plays in this as well. And if you know anything about media history, which I know, Stacey, you do, the media, <laughs> history behind, the media history behind lynching and Ida Wells and everything else really goes to this idea of I get to declare your guilt without any process whatsoever if you're a Black defendant. And OJ's case really blew that up completely because it really ran through the legal system the way it should have, and the way it would have for a white defendant as well. And for a lot of people, that was a culture shock, which of course it is. Well, yeah, it was uh, indeed. And Natalie uh, Ferrier is writing, uh, is asking, did Mr. Cochran have to blackify OJ's home? Yeah, we talked about that. Um, certainly, um, that was a, that was a uh, one of Johnny Cochran's mo's. You know, he knew exactly. He read the room. He absolutely read the room. Right. Um, right. Katia, um, so so. We have this legal dream team cost six and a half million dollars or so. Um, something that that um, seemed to irk black folks during the OJ trial. Um, and I heard a lot of black women, especially was Chris Darden. Um, talk about, if you will, the effect um, that Chris Darden had on this trial. Well, number one, he was brought up on not to say he's not a good attorney or did he wasn't qualified because he was black. Simple. They, they wanted him, they wanted that black presence on the team because just the idea of Marsha alone as a white woman coming for a black man with this jury was not, the optics were not good. They, they understood that, you know, white women had a bad history coming after black men just because. So like, they brought him in in order to dissipate some of that perception. It's like everyone said, it's a problem is that OJ had money. You know, he had somebody, he had Johnny Cochran. So no matter how many black guys they would have brought in, Johnny Cochran was just that good of an attorney. And also we got to mention that Johnny Cochran had a history of suing the LAPD. He understood how the LAPD worked. So he had a lot, you know, the inner working. So he wasn't coming into this, as you stated, cold. But the whole idea was that to bring in Christopher Darden was like, okay, so you have a black man against a black man, so we can cancel each other out. But Johnny Cochran just had presence also. You know, he's very charismatic. <laughs> he was yeah. a good orator. I'm not an attorney, but I know that in order for you to be a good trial lawyer, you have to be able to command the courtroom. You know, he had confidence. He wasn't letting these people push him around. So all of that, you know, already, you know, people would sit up when the law court proceedings, you forgot this was on TV, but when Johnny was on the floor, we all were like leaning forward. We were paying attention. And that is something, whereas Christopher Darden was more or less like, you know, he was on this crusade, like, you know, justice and everything, but he wasn't charismatic. So mm -hmm. I feel, you know, I feel a little bad for him because I feel like he he lost before he stepped in the room. Mm -hmm. Chris Darden? Well, um, <laughs> when you have, when you're going up against a Johnny Cochran, the, the chips are against you. And what, one of the, the, the things that many may not know is that Johnny Cochran, though he was not um, on the defense team uh, publicly, he was the uh, he was instrumental in Michael Jackson's acquittal in 2005. He actually was the uh, I see him at Neverland. He he'd actually um, direct uh, that team. And uh, he's the one who brought on Tom Mesereau to lead that. And uh, so Johnny Cochran was really uh, once he got involved, uh, you knew that the, the 
defend the defendant now had more than just the puncher's chance of of, of an acquittal. Uh, Rashonda, um, again, the the mistakes made. So so let's talk about the jury because they, it, they did have eight black women on that jury, and uh, the mistakes made was incomprehensible. As Lauren uh, mentioned earlier, too, uh, one of the things that struck me, to, well, not struck me, but one of the things I believe, other than the glove don't fit, because I think the real thing that that lost that case was Mark Furman. And, and the fact is that you have to, when you plead the fifth, what, what the jury may not have known, what most people may not have known at that time is when you plead the fifth, you have to do it on every single question that's asked. And there was a motion, most people right. may or may not remember, from the prosecution to just say, okay, let's just accept that Mark Furman is pleading the fifth and sit him down. Johnny Cochran said, no, we want him on the stand and for him to do it from the stand. We want him to answer these questions. And he asked him a series of questions. And one, to me, the, 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 the moment that raise reasonable doubt above all was when as lauren said they asked him the one question did you plant that glove and he said i refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it might incriminate me that to me when you get up so so when you when you talk about the jury and people criticize the jury what choice did the jury have uh, rashawn Right. And that is the bottom line. And, and again, what, what white people seem to have forgotten in this trial is that all you need to do is plant a reasonable doubt. And that's what the skilled Johnny Cochran did glove. in that moment <laughs> was planted the reasonable doubt. And so you have these um, women, especially the black women on the jury, you already have this. We're trying to be um, objective. We're trying to put aside any of our implicit bias. But here's a reasonable doubt right here. And so that gave them the ammunition they needed to acquit him. Uh, and so, you know, it was just a, a matter of being, as you said, outmatched. And it almost felt like they had never seen Johnny Cochran before, because how did you come in here so illfully prepared to go up against this man? Well, I'm going to stick with you for a second, Rashonda, because you're 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 Houston. I'm New York <laughs> uh, at, at the, the famous or uh, infamous Bronco chase. Um, it happened during uh, I believe it was. Uh, I want to say game six? Uh, no, it wasn't game six. It was, it was perhaps game five of the NBA championship. Knicks mm -hmm. and the Houston Rockets, New York Knicks, Houston Rockets. And uh, I remember the garden, Madison Square Garden, 20,000 folks uh, during an NBA championship game. The garden appeared half empty because most of the crowd got up and went to the concession stand to watch the chase <laughs> on television. An NBC of all OJ's network, and one of his best friends, Bob Costas, was calling the game. How surreal was that, Rashonda? <laughs> you know, that was that was the beginning of our obsession with with uh, <laughs> watching uh, things play out on the news, and and everybody was watching this slow speed chase. You know, and, and I think it was because it was a new thing. It had been on 24 seven, the whole um, issue of, of this, this case. And just to watch that, I just remember, you know, you're, you're rooting for him to get away, but you're like, okay, what's good. But this is before we knew all that we, we know now. Cause I was one of those in the beginning, OJ didn't do it until he wrote a book that said, if I had did it. Uh, but I, I think it just really was the um, beginning of being able to see things play out publicly. And everyone was riveted. I remember that they, they cleared out that stadium for that game. Yeah, I mean, he they went to the concession stands because the concession stands had televisions. Yeah. And, um, you know, you'd think they probably pay, paid a premium for these uh, NBA Finals tickets, but they were more interested in what was going on on free television. <laughs> so, but it was it was just so like and as I said, NBC happened to have been covering uh, or, or broadcasting the game with Bob Costas, who recently spoke about OJ, but um, and 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 how he felt finally broke, breaking his silence after all these years on it. But Bob Costas is a very respected uh, commentator. But I want to mention something to Takuma that Power 96 brought out, and, and that's really part of the point of this program this morning, the, the effect of the O.J. Simpson 
and, and there is uh they're not fighting over oj innocence or guilt right? <laughs> <laughs> but um but i want to point this out because i think it's very important and power 96 mentions that we have not had a majority black jury in a high profile case since juror nullification is has always been real but even more real since OJ, I watched it. I, Lauren, Lauren covers a lot of these big trials. She mentioned me too. I know she's at a lot of those trials. I was at both Cosby's trials. I was at Michael Jackson's trial. And you watch ha as prosecutions, particularly in the Bill Cosby case. And again, this is not about innocence or guilt. This is just facts. The jury nullification of black folks is as real as ever. I remember being on the phone during the middle Tacoma of the, the Cosby jury selection and watching as I'm going to give you one for instance this black woman police officer uh, from Allegheny County was uh, selected by the Cosby team and the prosecution had no more strikes but they objected to her and then they brought up that she was terminated from her job because she falsified somebody's time card. Turns out, and, and, and defense was able to show this, that it was a false allegation. She actually sued Allegheny County over this false allegation and was awarded $3 million, back pay, her job and everything. But the judge still said, well, just to avoid any impropriety, we're gonna dismiss her. Dismissed her. I was on the phone with Jesse Jackson. I said, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we're, what, we're looking at this in real time during notification. And he said, Stacy, that's something that the civil rights movement fought, fought, fought about. We, we've been fighting for that all of our lives and it continues to happen. And he alluded to the fact that uh, the one trial that we didn't have, that was OJ Simpson. But Power 96 brings up a great point. Since O.J. Simpson, we have not seen that, um, Takuma. Uh, yeah, I, and I would agree with that because um, I'm even thinking of the high profile cases we have that are going on right now uh, in Atlanta, in particular with Young Thug, um, the rapper and uh, the movement that he's associated with. Um, uh, there, there isn't an all black jury there. Although when you look at Fulton County, the demographics, I'm not sure it's necessarily representative um, of the area. Um, and that would make a whole lot of sense to me uh, with regard to that. Again, pointing to the phenomenon that was the O.J. Simpson trial and that it's so rare. And again, with this distance that we've had, being able to see why it mattered so much. Um, and there was something that you allu alluded to as well, um, that the O.J. Simpson was really the first glimmers of what we think of as this post-truth society that we mm -hmm. we live in, where um, um, what's true may be obscured by what's more evident or what's more believable in, um, and in accordance with people's biases. Um, and again, we saw that with OJ. We're seeing that with the example you pointed out with jury nullification, and we're seeing it, of course, with um, uh, 45 right now. Well, see, I've always, and, and again, I. I've always said this um, about court trials, especially when it comes to black folks. And this is why um, it was disappointing to me. I understand people's feelings about uh, Bill Cosby, but it was disappointing that more black people wasn't paying attention. Not for Bill Cosby. It's like we didn't cheer for OJ. We cheered for Johnny Cochran. We cheered because those cops got away with beating Rodney King half to death. We cheered because of the Scottsboro uh, brothers, or uh, boys, I should say. We cheered for Emmett Till um, when OJ was 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 acquitted. It was those cheers were for Emmett Till. Those cheers were for uh, the Scottsboro uh, boys and, and all other black folks who had been done wrong by the justice system. It had nothing to do with OJ Simpson, right? The Cosby thing, um, we saw. I saw so much corruption in that case. Not again, I'm not speaking to his guilt or innocence, just saying the way it was run. And when we talk about reasonable doubt, that's why it horrifies me, Lauren, when um, the former Manhattan DA, Cyrus Vance, made the comment that just the, when you're talking about me too, just the mere allegation should be enough for a conviction. 
it's horrifying as a black individual when you go down that path and forget about the process, the process. So they have innocent until proven guilty. OJ was guilty until proven otherwise, just like every other black defendant. But OJ had the resources. And well, many of us don't. Yeah. Go ahead, Lauren. No, yeah. I, want, I want your take. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So I just got finished watching in the courtroom the Jonathan Majors case. All white jury with only one, actually I shouldn't say all white jury, one black juror, one black female juror that they tried to kick out because she was doing something back there questioning what was going on, which she should have been. You had the media completely on the side of the accuser, Miss Grace Jabari. And so the media plays the same role as it did when Ida Wells was fighting the media in the late 1800s, which is they are part of the, you know, oh my goodness, this person's definitely guilty and we don't really care what the evidence is. So what, there's a video of Mr. Barry chasing Mr. Majors through Manhattan, big deal. Yeah. So what the public then sees, and this is why I think we are post-truth at this point, the public is seeing what the media is telling them and believing it because there is no other source. And then they look at it and go, well, this all makes sense because this headline in the New York Times says that Jonathan Majors has a history of this and that. Then when you're sitting in the courtroom, you're seeing all the evidence play out. You're seeing the testimony firsthand. It's as if a different trial is happening. I once heard Reverend Al Sharpton say, and he's right, when you read the black press, it's like reading another version of America because a lot of times you're in the courtroom and our version of events, particularly when you put it up against history, is got the context with it, which of course the white folk, white press is not gonna have, particularly the New York Times, particularly the New York Times, particularly NPR, by the way, and particularly Rolling Stone, who was obsessed, Rolling Stone in particular was obsessed with, with the Majors case. I know the feeling that you had in the Cosby case. I was never, I've never been a Bill Cosby fan ever since Pound Cake. Right, but, but the thing about it, Lauren, wait, let me just say this, it's not about- <laughs> I, know you're gonna, I know you're gonna defend them. I get that no, you're not defending him. The you, you, evidence. So, so, the wait, evidence before, before, Lauren, before, before you go on, Cosby. let's make mm -hmm. it clear. It's not about being a fan. It's not about being, it's not about saying he's guilty. It's not about saying he's innocent. It was about the process is what I'm talking about. And this is what the OJ Simpson jury did. They went by the process and got murdered, as, as pardon the, the pun, but they, in the, in the court of public opinion, got murdered because they came back in four hours and said not guilty, but they went by what the rules were. The rules mm -hmm. said that if you have if you're beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must acquit him. And, yeah, so the so process that the process in this country has never been fair to African Americans. Anyone who knows anything about history knows that we were never even considered citizens until 300 years into this country. I mean, so the idea that this is all, uh, you know, when we look at cases like the Daniel Perry case or the Kyle Rittenhouse case, Kyle Rittenhouse kills two people, <laughs> right? Kills two people and has a, a massive, you know, rifle on his shoulder. We all understand that there's no way a black person get away with that. When we see the, the, the case with the Breonna Taylor case, not only does Breonna Taylor get killed by the police, they then go into a parking garage and try to cover it up, all of which gets revealed. And then we got to sit here and listen to idiots like Candace Owens tell us that, oh, well, this happened because it was her fault, which is always the magic trick, right? With Trayvon Martin, it happened because it was his fault, because somehow or another he attacked somebody. With Michael Brown, it happened because it was his fault. Any reasonable person understands that mm -hmm. when a teenager with no record whatsoever, by the way, gets shot eight times, five times of which are in the back, there's something wrong with that story. Now that's a history that we as African-Americans have had to deal with for 405 years. White folks don't have to consider any of these things when stuff happens that's, in their lives. You know, you know, we're the ones that have to consider this type of history. And with OJ, that's why it also culminates in OJ. It also too culminates in these present day trials because quite frankly, you know, I thought the Majors case, if you, if you took a picture of that courtroom, almost all white press corps, only on the day that he, the, the sentence, the verdict came out, did I see two black reporters, completely white press corps, almost 
uniquely yeah. white jury in Manhattan, a city with two, two million, yeah. I mean, two million black folks sitting around. <laughs> and yep. and nobody, nobody, nobody even writes about that in the media. Nobody same, even notices <laughs> any of same, it. It's, it's same, amazing. Same with Cosby. And again, Erica Dixon saying pound cake. And see, the problem I have with that, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this at all. The problem I have with that is fine. You want to be mad at them. But here's the thing. You want to be mad at the pound cake speech. You have every right to be, right? But here's the thing with that. The point is not about what, it's about black and white here, right? This black man had the resources and still they recognized that he had the resources. And so the judge was determined this was not going to be another OJ case. The, the judge was determined that he was going to stack the deck against this black defendant. That's the concern. Not that Bill Cosby was Bill Cosby. Not that he said a pound cake speech that that dissed us all in front of white folks. Not that. That doesn't matter. But Katia, what does matter? What does matter is this process. This this the law that the the jury in the OJ case, right? One of the jurors said, "Look, the guy said he played the fifth on. Uh, he, he you know he said he couldn't answer the question about whether he planted the glove or not. So in other words, he planted the glove." That's enough reason for that. Uh, the, the other cop took blood home with him for the weekend. And then this blood gets smeared in different places that is questionable. That's reasonable doubt. So you, you, you had a situation where finally a black defendant led by a, a, a powerful black lawyer was able to win in a system rigged against them. Um, one of the things that Gil Garcetti, the district attorney, said to me, the Los Angeles district attorney said to me some years later after the trial, um, was that I asked him, well, you know, the crime was committed in Santa Monica, Lily White, Santa Monica, because, you know, as uh, Takuma pointed out, OJ lived in Brentwood and, you know, he was you know, a million dollar homes and stuff like that. Why did you move the case? to downtown Los Angeles, totally different jury pool. I said, I believe you wanted a black or minority jury to convict him. And he said, well, no, that wasn't necessarily the case. This is his words. He said, he said, we needed to accommodate the media and there was work being done at the Santa Monica courthouse. Um, I couldn't believe he said that for the record. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so I think you have a situation here where um, in the OJ case too, so many, so many factors, as we've already discussed, um, all of the, 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 the Rodney King thing was certainly huge, the Rodney King situation, but these other factors, the mistakes that Lauren pointed out, the, the, the craziness that she pointed out with Furman and, 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 and Darden and the glove, um, but you also had the decision from the decision maker, the, the district attorney himself, moving that child to Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles. That was big, uh, Katia, don't you think? Well, 100%. But let's also say that it's been the other way. When the officers that, you know, beat up Rodney King, they took it to a county that favored them. Jimmy Valley. So, you know, and people, and we knew that once they did that, they were going to go free because, you know, at the time, and probably still now, we knew that white people weren't going to convict the police. Like it just had, it was not, it did, the odds were against it. But I do want to say one thing in terms of jury pool, right? Absolutely. I agree with what everyone said, but we also as black people have to show up when we are called to serve. I know way too many people that are registered voters that when it's time to show up to be on someone's jury, that are like, ooh, I want to get out of it. I don't want to be bothered. I have things to do. Well, you can't complain about the system and what it does if you don't show up and do your part as a citizen. That is also a responsibility that we have. If we don't like what's going on with the court system, we got to show up. And there are a lot of people who probably would make juries that aren't going because it's a, they don't want to get paid a little bit. They don't want to get caught up in something like that. So I think that is something that we have to discuss a little bit more. Why is it that on the one hand, we, we know what the justice system is, but then when we have an opportunity, as you all stated, it was fought so hard for us to be able to have a voice, be able to vote, to be able to have all of these so-called rights, 
we also act like, oh man, I I, I can't, I don't want to be away from my house. I don't want to be bothered. You got to show up to be counted. You got to show up to be in those things. And I agree, you know, with that Jonathan Majors case, it was just, cause we, you know, it's Hollywood is very weird. You know, we can name a whole bunch of people that have done a whole heap of mess where Hollywood is like, okay, come on in. Mel Gibson comes to mind. And Jonathan Majors, who was, you know, it's a misdemeanor. And now it's like, you know, he's all of a sudden an abuser. He's this, he's that. And also social media acts and all of that. I can't even think what the world would have been like if we had social media during the OJ trial. (laughs) (laughs) It's all of these things, you know, where, you know, you have to kind of like pause and say, wait a minute. Let's let's look at the facts. Let's look at the thing. And and I think that's all of those things, you know, where it, I think that's where responsible journalism comes in. Not me. I always like to these days, I'm always saying, well, yes, there's media and underneath media, there's journalism and that's what everybody else is doing, you know, the podcast bros. So it's our responsibility to kind of like, I know it's a struggle to say, hey, these are the facts, not the feelings, not the clicks. Yep. This is what we can prove, and this is what the situation is. So I think we have a tremendous responsibility as journalists to call out the inaccuracies, even when it's our own people. It be our own people that be out there telling the alternative facts. So I think all of those things matter. I think it's really important when we tell these stories, especially what's going on with with forty five. You know, hey, we know why you know why certain people feel the way that they do when we know the truth so i think again um as far as jury pool we have to say are we doing our part when our card is punched are we showing up and a lot of people will sadly tell you well you know i'm thinking of 15 million different excuses on how I can get out of this instead of saying, you know what, let me take this serious and show up and be counted. You know, um, Rashonda, Mike V says this, and I, I, I think you'd be great to respond to this. He says black folks uh, aren't showing up talking about for jury selections uh, because the court is a source of generational trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely spot on. You know, one of the things that I just don't think we realize the importance of being down at the courthouse um, is coming up, showing up to serve on these juries. We don't realize the, the long term um, importance of that. But that is so correct because, you know, we know some people that go to court and their lives are changed drastically. You know, all of us have someone in our families who have had their lives altered by a courthouse. So it is years of generational trauma from showing up and being at the courthouse. I, most of the black people I know are like, no, nah, I'm good. I stay away from the courthouse by all means. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, you really look at how that affects us on the other side. But that is is accurate um, on all levels. Yeah, and David Youngblood is saying the court is a no-go space. Nothing good happens to for us there. Um, so it kind of backs up what you were saying there and what um, Mike V was saying. Um, Takuma, uh, Greer asked a question, and I guess everybody can chime in, but we'll start with Takuma. Um, she says, how do you feel about Marsha Clark, at her attitude about being a black women whisperer? She clearly overplayed her hand. I think there's also the attitude that we can be controlled. Hmm. The we can be controlled part? Are we talking about the perception of um, our, our perceptions being changed because of um, whiteness and being adjacent to black people and being favorable favorable toward black people and trying to understand the context of that question. Yeah, and she okay. yeah, she said yes. <laughs> he's he's like the thinking man over there. <laughs> yeah, I am I, I'm trying to come up um with with an example here. Um, that fits that, and I, I have to think about that a little bit more. I'd like to defer to my other, um, George, my uh, other go, go, uh, go ahead, ladies. <laughs> yeah, I think Marsha really, you know, again, that it just shows how, um, uh, 
how much he was not up to the task. The entire team, as as we said earlier, I think they thought, well, Christopher will handle the black part, and Marsha will will appeal to these as a woman. And you know, at the end of the day, they're sitting in in this courtroom, and you know, we we like a show, and Johnny gave a show, so Marsha <laughs> could have whispered all she wants wanted, but bl those black women were looking at the show Johnny was putting on. Yeah, and and Lauren, wasn't that offensive? What um what uh Rashonda just truthfully stated that Christopher Darden was there for the black for the black part. Was isn't that offensive in some way? Um, yeah, I, they should have put their best folks up there. I don't want to imply that because he was black, he wasn't the best attorney because I don't know who else was in their office at the time. Right. Uh, but so, I, you know, they did need to put their best. You see Alan Dershowitz and Johnny Cochran and F. Lee Bailey coming in a big case that you know is going to involve a celebrity and be all over the place on TV. You do want to put people up there who's the best in your office at the time. I really don't know who that was. We only saw, of course, Marsha Clark and Chris Darden. Uh, to go back, though, uh, on the subject of facts and the media, uh, I think one of the reasons why... Um, things are so complicated now. Of course, the media has a huge challenge of misinformation and disinformation, uh, particularly put on media platforms that have no uh, have no responsibility with regard un under the defamation laws as they stand now. Anybody can sort of write anything they want. And these media platforms are protection, protected by Section 230. But um, more importantly, we have a press corps, particularly younger members of the press, that want their feelings in the, in the in the stories rather than the facts. All the time. And I've gone up against this many times, where you have certain facts in a story, particularly if we're dealing with somebody who's black, because oftentimes the dynamic is the the uh, the defendant is black, the press corps is white. The press corps went to Wellesley, Wellesley and Hamilton College and, and don't have no relationship whatsoever to the black community. And you're having to be the whisperer of that case to some member of the press. It's not only have I been a member of the press, I've been a crisis manager. And that has been a fascinating experience. And as you can see with this uh, argument going on with NPR in the background, even though I don't particularly agree with everything that Uri Berliner had to say, he made some really good points because what's happening now is people want their narrative. They want a story. They want to advocate. They want to be political rather than just giving the public the facts and the public can see it. The public can see the politics behind a lot of these stories, whether they're on the right or the left, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC, they can see it. And that is killing the media right now. <laughs> Absolutely killing the media because uh, we saw it in the Johnny Depp situation where people, random people on YouTube, we're giving more facts and more details about the case than the media was for political reasons, because NBC and CBS wanted Amber Heard to be a hero instead of just telling the public what the facts of the case were. And the facts of these cases, a lot of times are very complicated, particularly when you have men and women in a marriage. Usually what you find is that there are mistakes and foolish behavior on both sides of that equation. Uh, and then the media wants to report it as the woman is the hero, and the, and the and the man is the is the villain in every single case, particularly in the Me Too setting. So so that is killing the media, in my view. This whole thing, this this thing toward opinion. I think the root has become, frankly, an anti-black platform. If you just go read the headline, the root. Oh, without that. question. The oh root. My we could have a, we could have a whole episode on the root because the oh, root has God. become strange. The root has the, become strange in terms of what they're putting the out there. The root is totally so anti-black, especially anti-black yeah. men. Right, um, exactly. There's no question and so about that, it. That's become almost dangerous. I mean, it's become strange. Yeah, very much so. I mean, what what much other so. group of people has a platform where what other ethnic group or religious group or anything else in the country has a, a, a news platform that's supposed to be about their group that's negative about their group? What would that what group would that be? So the root has become strange. And so we're in sort of a battle, an information battle. We realize AI is scraping the internet for all this information. So what we feed into that matters and that's becoming huge because if ai if, if ai wins the court case with regard to the information they can scrape off the internet and amalgamate into chat gpt and everything else that means that all this misinformation is part of that equation so we have to be thinking strategically yeah. as black folks in a way that no other group has to think because our history is the one that gets attacked and buried and changed and all these other games that are happening around the country 
So, um, Katia, the, 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 again, the, the mindset of the culture. This is a, is a moment that happened that really um, brought the culture to the forefront. Uh, let, dive into that just a little bit more. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about the atmosphere, what was going on at the time. Um, what's the lasting effect on the culture of O.J. Simpson in, in that trial of the century? You can't, I say this all the time and people don't quite get it. Like, I think we see it when people have this adverse effect um, on how they feel about Oprah. Like they'll blame stuff on her that is just ludicrous, right? Where you, you're just like, what is wrong with you? If you're a logical person, people think that if you are a black person with money or some people that do have money think that that all of a sudden erases your blackness, you now get a fair shot. You're now part of the status quo. And 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 OJ proved that when you're a black person with money, you're just you're still black. Did the word <laughs> erase that. And I think, you know, I think unlike OJ, Oprah gets that. She's often talked about how she's been denied, she's been questioned, she can afford things, she's been turned away from places. And that's Oprah Winfrey. So, you know, if Oprah Winfrey is is getting these doors, you know, what is it that people say the difference between racism when you're broke and when you're rich is it's just more passive, but it's still there. You know what I mean? It's not directly in your face. So I think that's the thing is, you know, understand that no amount of success, you can marry whoever you're going to marry. You can be this poster child. You can have this perfect image. Um, I think we see it a little bit, not to say that Will Smith is someone that doesn't stand firmly in his blackness, but we saw that, you know, when, when he had a moment, you know, of, of a lapse in judgment. And, and all of a sudden this man went from slapping someone to all of a sudden being a thug, being an abuser, being a criminal, all these things. And you're like, wait a minute, did we see the same thing? And, 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 you know, people wanting him kicked out and we're all like, well, wait a minute, but if we're kicking Will out, there's a slew of people that are still welcomed at these things that have you know, convictions and abuses and criminal charges and the list goes on and on. So I think that's the, the case that we have to remember as black people, no matter how much money we have, we have better resources. Like everyone stated, we can fight things a little bit better. We give ourselves a fighting chance, but we're always gonna be black first, no matter where you live, no matter who you marry, no matter who your friends are, what country club membership you have the world is always going to remember and remind you that you are black first, second, third, and last. And um, uh, Rashonda, when you think about um, the reaction from how it was split totally down the middle, white and, and black, um, and you think about, as uh, has been mentioned, the, the uh, Trump situation today, uh, Power 96 has reminded me that he predicted there would be no more than two black jurors on that case. And I owe him 30 pounds of crawfish because of it. Uh, um, but uh -huh. um, when, when you think about the, um, the, the fact that the country today now more so than ever, we saw it vividly when the OJ verdict was announced, um, the, 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 the comments from white folks, uh, even in that clip earlier that Greer played with the white woman saying it's, you know, it's about race, but but but, but for black folks, um, and now today it's more in our face with uh, un, since the you know really since uh, Obama uh, was in office, but certainly more so since Trump uh, came on the scene as a, a you know heavyweight politician, um, we we see this divide, and there's nothing to suggest that we are, that it's going to get better. You know, right. And and um, unfortunately, there's still so much that needs to be done in understanding and, and having them understand where we're coming from, understanding the races. And you continue to have things that polarize, um, the, especially, uh, you know, as, as Lauren said earlier, the white community who, when they feel like they have been wronged in, in any way, they try to wipe out um, history by banning books. They try to go critical race theory, uh, they, you know, and so we're we have that challenge and we've got to continue fighting against it because for our children, especially if they remain ignorant of the injustices of the past 
and they will uh, grow up thinking they don't need to see each other through a tainted lens of history of politics, and they're going to be doomed to repeat it. And so it is it is our job as as journalists to continue telling our stories and being vocal. Um, I, you guys mentioned the root. I thought it was just me <laughs> noticing uh, the change at the root. I was like, what is going on? Uh, but it is it is crucial that, that we call it out and we continue to stand on our own principles. Yeah. And uh, Takuma, I, I don't know if you've seen the whole thing with the root, too, that we're talking about. But that's, you know, I think Vishanda uh, brought up a great point. Um, and, you know, Lauren kicked it off. The Root is certainly anti-Black, um, has become anti-Black for some odd reason. Uh, but this, telling the stories, not only do we must must continue to tell the stories, Katia knows it too, that we've been uh, telling the stories. Of certainly Black-owned uh, uh, press has been telling the story. But how do we get folks to really pay attention because uh, we are telling the story. Yeah, and uh, getting back to the lessons to bring it full circle about the impact of the um, OJ trial as um, the dominant television event that it became, I think what's clear is that since that event, we realized the importance of multidimensional communication in the sense of you can appeal to the logic of people all you want. Um, the prosecution may have had the best laid plans factually about why their case stood up, but when it comes to the theater um, and being able to appeal to somebody at a very um, primordial level, a base level, um, that still matters. Um, and it's why we have the famous phrase, <laughs> the gloves don't fit, why that still echoes because Johnny uh, Cochran knew that that uh, televised courtroom was about theater. Uh, 45 knows that politics is about theater. So again, when we talk about being in this post-truth society and our responsibility as journalists, how do we cut through the noise using facts, but using a method of, com of communication that really gets at the root of, of, of people? and makes a lasting impact. Yeah. And, and Lauren, I'll give you the last thought on that. I know you had, to, you look like you had some thoughts on that. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. One is that obviously the technology has completely changed and it has given everybody the platform really on an equal basis uh, in terms of anybody can get on anything and broadcast uh, and blow up. I mean, and actually blow up and get a lot of audience. Uh, and so, you know, obviously the environment has changed toward uh, the this value of audience for audience sake, no matter how irrelevant the subject matter may be. And the media is uh, struggling to catch up to that because what has happened now is the media is of course competing with anyone who has a cell phone at any given place and time who could report what happens right in front of them at any given place in time. So the media is competing against that and competing against the fact that people's attention is divided from, by everything from gaming to uh, folks on YouTube who may or may not have a relevant opinion. And then that environment, the media has decided, I think most of the press has decided that it really doesn't matter what it takes to get the clicks and the attention to the website, we are going to put that on. And so facts are taking a back seat to, uh, to feelings and to emotion. And of course, the fact that Facebook had discovered that to get people emotional and angry was the way that you got traffic. And now the media is duplicating that strategy. And that is all bad news, generally speaking, for black people. Unless, of course, we own and control our own platforms. I keep telling my friends in media to stop arguing in these newsrooms, you know, uh, with these white folks that control the game because they do not know our history to the extent they do know it, they don't care. And then when they do know it, that doesn't mean they're going to amplify it in the same way that we would amplify our own story when we tell it. So it's a completely different thing when you're telling your own story. They're telling their story, right? They're telling their story and we need to counter that by telling our story and stop wasting time and build platform. As you can see with uh, things like Club Shay Shay and a few other topics, and I know 
you know, a lot of people might not consider uh, Shannon Sharp a particularly good example because he is doing entertainment, and not hard news. But I would argue that one of the reasons why Shannon Sharp has blown up is because he is talking to a constituency that everybody ignores, which is generally speaking, black men. He talks to a lot of black men on his show. He himself is a black male. He is a uh, fo- he is a not just an average football player. I think he has three or four Super Bowl rings. He is a Hall of Fame, you know, level player. So everybody knew who he was from the jump. And because of that, he is able to gain millions and millions and millions of people. I think that there is certainly a black woman out there who could do the same exact thing and who will do the same exact thing and amplify the topics that she feels are important as well. But because the media completely ignores black men and doesn't hire them into any of the newsrooms I've worked in, whether it was USA Today or ABC News or anything else, you know, things like the OJ case and John Majors, I I know a lot of people want to quote the Malcolm X quote, and I totally get that as a black woman. But my view of it has always been that black men have been the ones that everybody talks about and vilifies, but doesn't actually hire. So they don't have a seat at the table. So what we're seeing is a constituency, black people more generally, broadly, and black males more specifically in the case of Shannon Sharp, having an audience and blowing up and making money with that audience. And that is what we have to do as black folks. I'm hoping some uh, black woman comes along and does the exact same thing Shannon Sharp does. I think that will happen. Certainly Beyonce could do it at the, at the, you know, <laughs> the drop of a hat, but she's busy with a lot of other things. But I'm just saying that we as black folks have to own and control our platforms and our story. Because if we don't do that, we're going to have other people deciding what the narrative is. And that has been a disaster from the beginning of the printed press about 200 years ago. Yeah. May I just and, jump in for one second? I think yes. I understand. I I agree to a certain extent. That's why I always say is the problem isn't black. The problem is that we now lump everybody in under this umbrella of black media. The issue with the root is it's not black owned. It's it's right. black facing. You know, same thing with complex. Uh, the other thing mm-hmm. too is with someone like um, you know a Shannon Sharp. That's entertainment for a key key and it's where you get your tea. My problem is there's nothing wrong with having Shannon Sharp. We're going to Shannon Sharp to get journalism, to get news, which is the problem that we're having as black people. We have a gazillion black responsible platforms. We all contribute to those platforms. The problem is we, the public, don't support those places. We're supporting the key keys. And therefore, the Kikis now think they are journalism news places. They think they're like Time Magazine, which they're not. So the key is we have those places. And the reason why we're in those white newsrooms is because the Black spaces can't afford to hire us. They don't have the resources to keep us on there full time. So if we want to have Black journalism, right? And I want to stress journalism because what our colleagues are doing is entertainment, it's for clicks, it's for clout, it's not necessarily for informing and uplifting, especially this election cycle, then we must contribute as well as Madison Avenue. These play, these things are out here. It's not that hard. We don't have to create new things. You have to support the things that exist. And I ask these questions all the time of my friends. If you're so bothered by the Breakfast Club and the Root and the list goes on and on, are you subscribed to your local black newspaper? Are you supporting black journalism spaces? If the answer is no, then you're part of the problem. That's that's the conversation we've been having. The funding is what's missing to enable us to be able to compete in this new cycle and going out and doing the same misinformation craziness that the mainstream is doing by clickbaiting and or uplifting the shade room. I'm extremely bothered by this White House inviting, you know, Hollywood Unlocked in the shade room to be part of anything to do with journalism and the the journalism space. It's extremely bothersome for those of us that do the job. You know what I mean? Like I pride myself on being a good journalist on, on writing on facts. And even though my beat is mainly entertainment, it is still journalism. I still don't go in there and, and give people the tea. It is based on, you. we were talking about Jonathan Majors. It's picking up the phone and telling the facts about what is going on with this man and why he's getting railroaded compared to all these other folks. So I think we have to challenge this audience that watches this. Are you helping? Are you subscribing? Are you supporting? Are you retweeting just the shade room? The shade room doesn't need your help. 
Are you retweeting this program? Are you subscribing? Are you donating? If we all gave, you know, $10 a month, it will make a world of difference in some of these newsrooms. So I, I mm -hmm. would say if you don't like, and if you want to be part of the solution, you got to start supporting the platforms that are out there and you got to start supporting the work of black journalists that are doing the work, period. I think, With I think that, we always have to remember, I think we always have to remember though that no matter what yes. we're talking about, no matter what the subject matter is, there's mm -hmm. two things you always have to have. You have to have audience and you have to have money. You have to have money coming in. So that reaction to entertainment is, is really about the fact that entertainment and sports, which is really entertainment, bring the money. That's why right. the Shannon Sharp thing is blowing up, for example. Yeah. So until somebody figures out the code of how you can attract people, I think there's a, there's a medium there where you can kind of do a chicken and an egg. You can do some entertainment. Breakfast Club, Club actually does a fairly good job of this. They'll do entertainint and then they'll do hard news. I think sometimes with them, the problem is the folks they have are not necessarily deep enough to, to really get to the place where we want you know, that hard news to be. But nonetheless, they're doing the entertainment to get the audience and then they're hitting us with some hard, important topics. And who they do that with, I think, is is where the key is. But it's a it's a difficult conundrum because you do have to have that audience, but you have to make money. And making yeah, money but, a lot of times goes back to the entertainment piece. Yeah, and but Vishanda, uh, with that said, the um, the training of folks' mind when it comes to, to, to news now seems to be that they've now been trained to go to these alternative sites, these blogs and things like that. How do you undo that is really, I think, the challenge. Yeah, it's one we we constantly face because you know we're we have an uphill battle because people continue to think we're a recycling of press releases, um, and so we just have to continue doing the stories that we do, and the, you know it's all in the promotion as well. It, it dumbfounds us that we're so we've been a staple in the Houston community for so long, and we can easily go to a black event and half the people there have never even heard of us. Uh, and so it is an ongoing challenge. One of the things we're doing, though, is we're doing a lot of media partnerships trying to get out in front. Uh, we work with the Fox station and the M NBC station in Houston, trying to get out in front of people so that they can see we're an alternative to the daily news that they're getting. Um, and we're looking at things that matter to them. And I think that's just that we, ha we just have to keep going and not give up and then find other ways to promote it and let people know, hey, we're here. Yeah, what are you doing in Chicago, Takuma? And that I want to. That was a really good point about it's this battle between vegetables and candy, right? Um, essentially, when you talk about the entertainment news versus the more substantive things, and the the thing that I have to deal with daily is that, uh, for example, we have a upcoming series of stories about to publish on Monday about. Um, how segregation, historical segregation in Chicago has fathered the, the epidemic of Black homelessness here in Chicago as well. Um, but this is a very meaty, very substantive um, piece that uh, the reality is, is that if it isn't, um, uh, it won't probably, it probably won't be as well uh, read or attract the viewers that we would get for you know, some of our stuff that we do on Instagram, but we understand that that's part of the equation now that you have to speak to a younger demographic through Instagram Reels. So there's this constant balancing between informing people of community news, talking about substantive issues, and also mm -hmm. doing a reel about what Chance the Rapper did at the United Center, or Aja, I'm sorry, or um, Angel Reese and... Um, uh, Camila Cardoso joining, joining the Chicago sky. That's all a part of what we have to um, utilize to get news out. And um, I think that we have to remain true to who we are as the Chicago Defender, which is about to turn 119 years old on May 5th. Happy birthday for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have to continue to um, speak to those historical issues that have long plagued Black Chicago, but at the same time, we have to appeal to this younger demographic. So it's a constant dance. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we are taking a multi-pronged approach in terms of storytelling. And I think that we have to value the entertainment, the candy,
but we also have to use the candy to fund the vegetables. David mm -hmm. Youngblood says that he thinks more personal appearances by members of this panel, you guys, on uh, uh, alternative uh, platforms as personalities may help to increase our own platform numbers. Um, that might be certainly uh, a way to go. I know Lauren has a, you know, she she's a part of the high, very high profile Roland Martin uh, Unfiltered. Um, and, you know, Rashonda and her, uh, you know, book tours and, and everything else she does, uh, movies and things of that nature. And of course, Katia is, is I find Katia everywhere on, on uh, you know, when I look at social media, I mean, I, it's like she's, She's in demand. So, yeah, I agree um, with that. David says, I see you everywhere, Lauren. Um, real quick, we got five minutes uh, left. Let me ask this question um, as we we started, obviously, mostly about OJ. And um, and as Greer says, people forget we got to eat, too. Um, but um, the family of uh, Ronald Goldman, Fred Goldman, to be specific, has, for, you know, since... Uh, 1994 has gone after O.J. Simpson. Uh, there was a judgment, $33.5 million. Um, estimates with interest and everything now, he perhaps owes about $200 million to Fred Goldman, who's been chasing after this for, um, you know, 30 years. Um, his estate executor initially said Fred is not getting anything. Now he says he'll work with them. Um What's your thoughts? And I, let's, let's go around the table. Takuma, uh, Lauren, Katia, and then Rashonda. Your thoughts on this as they go through OJ's estate to, to try to put a, a value on it and see what's left, see what he he's had. What's your thought on uh, the the situation with the Goldmans? Because the Browns really have not uh, pursued any type of uh, the, the way Fred Goldman has. They have not. The Browns have not pursued this. Yeah. Um, so we we began this program talking about how OJ was the exception. Um, and I think that we see, uh, based on the memorabilia case that occurred years later, that um, he is indeed a Black man. And he got reminded by the criminal justice or, excuse me, uh, the court system in general about who he is. And this was um, the, the recompense, right? I mean, so to me, that's what, uh, when you look at the trial and you look at the events that happened after that, he was able to secure a historic win. Um, I do happen to think that he participated in the murders of Nicole Brown Simps Simpson um, and, and, and Goldman, but I also think that, um, you know, what ultimately is said with this memorabilia case, as specious as that case was, was that there's recompense coming and that you can enjoy our privilege, but the reckoning will come. And we saw that reckoning um, and it will continue once um, that settlement is paid out. Um, that 33, uh, I think it's 33 million or 30 million. 33 and a half million, but now with the interest is up to about 184 million or something of that nature. And he may very well be successful in recovering uh, a, a portion of that. If not more. Yeah, there's nothing more uh, indicative of the phrase, you know, do Black Lives Matter than, than this part of the discussion. Uh, first of all, O.J. Simpson was found not guilty. <laughs> uh, so why are we discussing? Uh, and there was a civil case in which there was a substantial amount of money awarded, even though he was found not guilty. OK, in a world where we are openly discussing things like um, qualified, uh, we're, we're discussing things like, you know, whether or not a city should pay out when a cop shoots somebody in the back three times. And then we find out, oh, that's right. They got a million dollars, you know, or two million dollars. But on this case, they got thirty three million. And now we're back again with another discussion. So I'm confused. I have to consult some of my attorney friends because I've worked. Well, they never received the money. The 30, okay. They never they never got judgment. Money. Well, they got a judgment of 33 million bucks. So someone mm -hmm. out there decided that the lives of those two people were worth 33 million dollars <laughs> after after the defendant was found not guilty. 
which is unheard of, by the way. <laughs> because right, typically right. what would happen is you'd turn around and say, well, he was found not guilty. So where is there any proof that there's a wrongful death case here on a civil level? So of course, because everyone's black on the defendant side, all of that goes out the window because you've never heard that ever happened before anytime, any place, right? So if this was a black, two black victims and a white person who uh, you know, allegedly killed them, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So I'm confused as to why we're even discussing this. I don't know that I would go as hard as OJ's estate as to come out with a statement five seconds after OJ's death to say, tell everybody, oh, they're not gonna get a dime. I do think OJ did this. So I think it is not you know, surprising that Ron Goldman's father uh, is still talking about this. I think he should be, as any father would be, had they lost their that's, son in yeah. such a violent way. I mean, I think he has that's, every right to do that's that. Where, I'm yeah. just saying, what? Right, and that's where I, I think about it, too, as a father, and I think about it, too, this way. I, right. I, I don't know that, because to, to me, and, and again, this is just me, it has come off that he, it's all about the money and not the punishment for, for, for Ron Goldman. That's mm -hmm. how, uh, for Fred Goldman, that's how I see it. I could be 100% wrong. Um, because well, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I have, I've, I've been part of legal teams where I was the communications person in a wrongful death case involving police and stuff like that. It is about the money. You, somebody's life ended when it should not have ended. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody's got to pay for that, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is about the money. I know in the Black community, we have this for some reason, I'm not sure what it is. You know, I think it's because we sit in church a lot and hear things like money's the root of all evil and stuff like that. At the end of the day, it is about the money. You yeah. have taken somebody's it's, life, it's, it's you've caused pain in that though. family. You have now destroyed the life of that family by, mm -hmm. by a male member of the family or female member of the family. Breonna Taylor should not be dead. That family should have gotten millions mm -hmm. and millions of dollars, right? And I think they got 12 million. That's a big deal to lose somebody's life that should be here. So yeah, it is about the money. So I'm not mad at Fred Goldman. He's he's right. Ron Goldman's father. He would be saying stuff like any other parent would. That's not a problem. I'm just confused mm -hmm. because it's very rare that you hear a situation where somebody's found not guilty and we're still sitting here talking about after yeah. they won well, the civil, civil cause. Uh, still the civil case, of course, <laughs> was an all white jury, and of course, civil. They say the the uh, burden of proof is a lot less in the civil. But go ahead, Katia. I mean, I think with the Browns, it's a little more complicated because there are children involved. They're related, right? You have their mother was murdered by their father and, you know, they're, they are, have siblings that older siblings, they're all family. So they don't want to cause any more damage to the kids. So I think that's why you don't see the Browns as active. I think the daughter, I think, is the one that's had the hardest time, you know, just living and being present because this, her brother being murdered, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't need, I can't even relate. And I'm even going to try right. to pretend, you know, I hope that I keep, every time I see, her, I'm like, I hope she has therapy because it seems like she has been stuck, you know, her marriage, everything. She has not been able to commit to things. She has children. Has this young woman lived at all? Do you know what I mean? And I think for the Goldmans, it, it it's it's a lot. It's the frustration that they feel like he got to walk around. But I hope him being dead kind of helps them move forward because there is not that visual reminder of him walking around, him playing golf. Um, I'm I, again. I'm. It's not for me to say whether or not they should have money, but I do think at some point you have to say to yourself, "This is something God awful that happened to us." Are we going? How do we live? How do we do? So, how do we move forward? You know, let's use this money to do some good. You know, let's help some victims or whatever the the case can be. Mm -hmm. But I hope that him being dead helps them move forward it will never give them closure because the result right. is you know he's not gonna they're not, they never got what they went to get but i do think that you know hopefully that family can move a little bit forward and live and be present have joy yeah. you know a little bit of yeah. joy Rashonda, you know let me preface the site by saying that the deaths of ron goldman and nicole brown simpson were very tragic. Um, and I do hope that the families find healing. There is a part of me that is that that feels some kind of way because had Ron Goldman been a young black man 
who was accused of being a drug dealer, um, this, the narrative would have been different. Um, and so it, it, that is another journey we have to tackle in this in this world, um, the the painting of victims. And, you know, it, it really saddens me. They, you know, that has been a race that has not, you know, that's very rarely addressed as it should be. I just would like to see our young black men who are victims of crimes uh, be painted with that same brush. Well, there you have it. The lasting legacy of the trial of the century. Um, I think we all agree that the um, outcome, the, the cheers were more for Johnny Cochran and more for, for uh, black folks as a whole than they were for O.J. Simpson, the defendant, whether you believe he's innocent or guilty. Uh, that was about uh, Johnny Cochran. That was about black folks. That was about, as we said at the top, um, Emmett Till, Scottsboro uh, boys. It was about Rodney King. It was about Justice Foundley being on the side of African Americans. And that's where we will leave it uh, this morning. Lauren Burke, I got to check out. Everyone's asking about uh, Lauren's uh, social media. Everyone's asking about Katia's social media, all your social medias. So if you don't mind, just take 10 seconds. How can people find you on social media? Uh, it's just at LV Burke on X. And I have a, I have a YouTube account, uh, which this is actually running through right now, which is my name. That's pretty easily searched. If you search my name, all of that will come. And Black up. Virginia News, and Black Virginia News. Yeah, that's a team. That's a few. That's a, that's like three or four people, and I'm the publisher of Black Virginia News. On yeah, Substack, I, I highly recommend Substack. By the way, it's a great, Substack. great thing. Tacoma social media. Well, I like to uh, again prop up ChicagoDefender.com. ChicagoDefender.com. Um, um, we're out here. We're in these streets. Uh, try to bring <laughs> that news about Chicago and beyond. Um, and then, you know, I'm on I'm on X uh, working to uh, generate my presence a little bit more on there. But you can find me at at Takuma Road, T-A-C-U-M is the money, A-R-O-E uh, is my handle. Great. Natalie Ferreira loves your voice, Takuma, by the way. Katia, where can we find you on social media? I'm easy to find. It's K-A-T-H-I-A underscore Woods. I'm the same thing on everything. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, even TikTok and everything. And as far as my personal interviews, you things you want to see me talking to Hollywood, it's on Cup of Soul show. And then, as always, you can read my writing at the Philadelphia Tribune, you know. And I'll see, hopefully, we'll see some of you in Chicago this summer when NABJ invades, you know, Tacoma. Mm -hmm. I'm open to good food places. We like good places. <laughs> I got them. I got them for you. <laughs> Rashonda, where can, we, where can we find you on social media? Um, same thing, Rashonda underscore Tate. And then the DefenderNetwork.com. Um, and I'm on I'm on X, but my other personality is on X. Don't look for the objective <laughs> journalists over there. <laughs> you think we all okay. are that? Yeah, yeah. And, then, and I love the fact, and um, I mean, listen, the platform now has made it that we, we like to agitate the owner just to, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. I could never serve on a Trump jury. Um, they would so, totally pull up my ex account. <laughs> I mean, I think it's only right. All right. Oh uh, wow. Well, thanks so so much. This great, great panel this morning. Uh, some great journalists. It's it's good to see. Uh, fantastic, top-notch black journalists all in one place. Uh, thanks again, Lauren, uh, Takuma, Katia, and Rashonda. And thank you all for joining. Let it be known. Have a safe weekend. And let's go Knicks. We'll see let's you Monday.